Welcome to Victims View, a show produced by the Solicitor General's Office. I'm Carmen Smith, the Solicitor General. The Solicitor General's Office prosecutes misdemeanor cases in state court, and many of them are related to incidents of domestic violence. A Hemsa House is dedicated to helping animal victims of domestic violence. Today, we're talking with Myra Rasnick, Executive Director of A Hemsa House. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Just give us some background of what is a Hemsa House? How did you get started? Absolutely. A Hemsa House was founded in 2004 by a survivor of domestic violence named Emily Christie. And Emily um, was in an abusive relationship and she left her abuser and went to a domestic violence shelter with her cat in tow, only to be told that they did not provide accommodations for her cat. Um, so Emily actually ended up losing her cat in the process and decided that nobody should have to choose between their own safety and that of a beloved pet. So, and is that a local organization or you within Fulton County or? We, are, we do have an administrative office located in Decatur. Um, however, we serve all of Georgia. So we serve the entire state, all 159 counties. Oh my, this could be a little bit overwhelming considering how many pet lovers we do have. Absolutely. If somebody wanted to contact your organization, how would they do so? Sure. Um, victims can contact our 24-hour crisis line or victims representatives at 404-452-6248. And people inquiring about our services or what we do or interested in volunteering could call our administrative line at 404-496-4038. Or anyone can contact us through our website at www.ahimsahouse.org. So there's many ways to contact you. Yes, absolutely. That's great. Mm -hmm. So do you have a large staff, say a thousand people? <laughs> <laughs> we feel like we need a thousand people. We have a very small staff of three right now. So um, there are three full-time staff members serving all of Georgia, but we do rely very heavily on volunteers because of that. Um, so we have a huge network of volunteers between four and 500 active volunteers right now that do everything for us from coming in and doing admin work in the office to staffing outreach events. Um, they they um, staff our booth at outreach events and we have um, crisis line volunteers. We have animal transporter volunteers to help get the pets back and forth to safety. Um, and we have foster home volunteers as well. So we definitely rely very, very heavily on, on our volunteers. Well, do the volunteers have to have special training or anything? I mean, sometimes um, I know some people will probably bring special skills to the table. Absolutely. But is there some kind of criteria to become a volunteer? It depends on their area of interest. Um, we, have, we have our training actually and orientation online on our website that people can access so that they can do it from the comfort of their own home anytime. Um, and then if they're interested in being a transporter or a foster home or a crisis line volunteer, there are some additional training and some additional steps and they have to pass a background check and things like that. And that crisis line, is that 24 hours a day? It or? is. Oh, that's mm -hmm. fabulous. So yeah. there's always a way to contact you. Yes. And, and the volunteer base, I think outreach is so important. Mm -hmm. So I'm glad you were able to do the show today, but do you go out to other venues if people ask you to come and speak and kind of explain what you do? We do. We have an outreach program where we go to communities to try to raise awareness about the link between domestic violence and animal cruelty. Um, and that includes community events, but um, also professional trainings to various agencies who are also doing victim services. We also um, go speak at civic groups um, around the state, actually, domestic violence task force meetings, um, lots of different places that people request a speaker, we're happy to go. So is this a state-funded organization? or Up until very, very recently, actually a couple of weeks ago recently, we um, were privately funded through um, private foundation grants and donors, and of course we do our own fundraising, but we recently received a small government grant um, through the Victims of Crime Act Victims Assistance Grant. Oh, congratulations. Thank you so much, and we're really excited and really proud because we are the first program of our type nationally to receive any government funding. Are there other programs like this? There are. Um, to our knowledge, currently we're the only ones that are serving an entire state. Um, many of them are local safe haven programs kind of set up with um, a, a partnership with a domestic violence shelter and maybe a humane society. Um, but we're the only ones that we know of that are encompassing the full range of victim services that we do and that we provide on our crisis line. 
Well, when you say your crisis line, that, is that the same line that you would call if you wanted to make a donation, a monetary donation? Actually, the administrative line would be the line for the donation. And give us that number again. It's 404-496-4038. And I imagine that you would work with other organizations. I think you mentioned some of them before. Um, for example, the Georgia Coalition or the other domestic violence kind mm -hmm. of nonprofit agencies that you would work with. What, yes. what, what are some of those? We're a member of the Georgia Coalition Against Domestic Violence. We are a member program. Um, we also work very closely with domestic violence shelters throughout the, throughout the state of Georgia. Um, many times we're getting calls from their advocates because someone has just shown up at a shelter with a pet or someone has called and wants to get to a shelter but they have a pet and, and don't want to leave that pet behind. So we get many calls from the shelter and work directly with many of the shelter programs. We also work very closely with law enforcement, victim witness assistance programs, solicitor's offices, and other victim services agencies throughout the state. And I believe you're also a member of the task force? We are. We're a member of several task forces, but we are a member of Fulton County Task Force. And tell us a little bit about, um, I guess, the relationship that you would have with those different organizations. Uh, you mentioned before that you had volunteers come in and they're interacting with the other organizations as well. Mm -hmm. What about your board of directors or do you have, is it just you or are you running the whole show? <laughs> no, we do have a board of directors that currently consists of nine members um, and then of course our, our staff of three and, and all of our amazing volunteers. And your board of directors, they basically make policy decisions and that kind of thing? They're actually policy, yes, policy governance. That is great. Yes. I, I guess you do have your hands full, though, with mm -hmm. the entire state. Mm -hmm. um, and you work with the different shelters, and it's always been amazing to me how few shelters that we have in Georgia. Yes. I think we need more of them, so you must get a lot of calls. I agree. We, we do need more, and we do get many calls from shelters. Sometimes we're actually the first point of contact for victims, so sometimes they'll find us on Google um, because they're actually more concerned about their pet safety than they are themselves and that's what I you know what we hear on the crisis line um, so then we're able to connect them with resources and get them connected with a domestic violence program or law enforcement or other agencies that they need to contact um, and then sometimes we get calls from all over the country from people who have found us that way and we're able to try to refer them to an agency in their state or locally f for them that can help them out have you been called to, I guess, assist with any court cases or anything of that nature? We have. We have um, testified in the past as an expert witness in cases that involve both animal cruelty and domestic violence. We've also been called upon just to provide assistance for victims um, who are going through the criminal justice process, and we're happy to help out with that in any way we can. And we've also provided funding for forensic veterinary care for animals that have been severely injured or even killed. Oh my goodness, I, I guess that would also entail an, another area of expertise mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Well, I would imagine that doing this statewide though, you have to keep a very, uh, I guess, active network of people for resources. We do, we absolutely do. And to um, for our safe housing program, we use a network of foster homes, but also boarding facilities and veterinary offices throughout the state that really help us out and, and give us um, in-kind donations and reduce rates for their services so that we're able to do this work. And how long would you say it will be the average stay for any animal? Typically it's about 60 days and that's kind of mirrored um, with a domestic violence shelter stay, a typical stay at a shelter, but our clients don't have to be staying at a shelter. That's not a requirement of ours. Uh, many times they are, but sometimes they might be staying with friends or family and can't take their pets along with them for various reasons, allergies or lease restrictions or any number of things. So um, we're able to help them out as well, but we try to make sure that they're somehow connected to the service system and receiving services in some way. So you try to help them any way you can, mm -hmm. I would imagine. Exactly. Well, I think that's very commendable because, again, I don't think that a lot of people know about your services, mm -hmm. but it's a good way to spread the word, so to speak, by going out and, and, and if other organizations invite you to come, I would be very thrilled to hear that we could also help you in that regard whenever Absolutely. we go out as well. Absolutely. We're happy to speak to, to anyone or any organization to help spread the word about what it is that we do and raise awareness about this issue. Well, we're going to take a quick break, but stay tuned because when we come back, we're going to learn more about a Ahimsa House.
Welcome back to Victim's View. I'm talking to Myra Rasnick, Executive Director of Ahimsa House. Myra, could you please tell us, in a typical situation, how would a case come to you? So typically, um, either we're the first call, um, as I mentioned, that a victim might call us first because she's so concerned about her pets, um, or we get a call from a representative from another service agency. Um, and we, the first step is really just calling our crisis line and talking with someone. Um, we provide many services including safety, safety planning including pets, um, help with including pets on protective orders, um, and also of course intake to our program. So getting those cases in, you know, it's, it's one of those things where we do have to have paperwork. I know that that can be kind of hard on people, but we're working right now to make our paperwork more accessible um, and mobile for people to be able to um, have that on their phones if they have a small smartphone and things like that so there's no more printing and signing and faxing so we're working on making that more available um, but you know when you're dealing with temporary custody handing over temporary custody of pets you know there has to be some paperwork signed. Well I, I would assume also that your crisis line is vital mm -hmm. because when you're in a trauma situation mm -hmm. and you're already stressed out mm -hmm. that there are a lot of things that probably you don't think about mm -hmm. but your staff would probably be very helpful in getting them to think about their options mm -hmm. and like you said the safety planning for right. the pet. Right, and in, in times of crisis, many times it's hard to be able to prioritize or figure out what steps need to be done next, so we're able to help with that. And so after they made the call and you've had the conversation, mm -hmm. then what usually takes place next? Then we give them our paperwork for them to fill out and they get it back to us. Typically, we get the paperwork the same day and we're able to get their pets in the same day because it's usually an emergency situation. Um, our clients, when they're calling, it's it's most of the time very urgent. Um, you know, they they only have a limited time and a small window to be able to escape. So uh, we work with that, and we understand that urgency, and we're able to get the pets in usually um, that same day, sometimes within an hour. Now, is this with any pets? Um, because I did have an assistant who had a very large snake. I never quite understood that. And I can't imagine you just take any kind of pet. We or do. do you? We do. <laughs> we mostly, of course, get dogs and cats, but we've had a snake ourselves. We've had rats, um, turtles, lots of birds. We've actually had horses before in our program. We had a call once for 18 chickens. Um, so we say that if it is an animal that, you know, can be used as leverage to get, uh, leverage against someone, we want to be able to remove that barrier for them and be able to help them to escape. So we don't place restrictions on the pets. We're going to try, I can't guarantee it, but we're going to try to help no matter the species and number of animals. But that would also be a challenge for your staff mm -hmm. to Absolutely. accomplish that, I imagine. Absolutely. It is a challenge, but we enjoy challenges, luckily. Okay. <laughs> I'm surprised by that, but that, that's good. That's yes. excellent. Yeah. So then what happens? So then typically we um, have, if, if somebody has a car, that makes our job a lot easier. Um, they're able usually to drop off on their way into shelter. So it's just kind of seamless and we'll let them drop off at a vet close to them. Um, and then we'll, our transporters will handle it from there. Um, because of our services, everything is completely confidential. We don't want abusers trying to locate pets, which has happened before. Um, and they usually try to find them as a way to get the victims to come back home. Um, you know, try to say, well, you know, I, I now have Fluffy back. You, if you want him to be safe, you should come back home too. And but what if they're, they're claiming ownership of the pet instead of the victim? as the owner of the pet. That happens too, and we try to help victims with establishing proof of ownership. That's usually up to a judge, so it's something that a judge would decide, but we certainly try to help victims with helping to establish that ownership. And I know that the, the shelters, they're also very um, aware of security issues mm -hmm. and confidentiality and so mm -hmm. forth. How do they keep in contact with you we have a signed release um, from our clients that we can talk to the shelter staff and they can talk to us so that we are able to communicate because of reasons like that. Um, so we do have a signed release so that works out. Um, but you know, it, it's one of those things, our, our foster homes are completely confidential. They never have any contact with the people whose pets they're keeping. We're the bridge between that and that's just for everyone's safety involved. Oh, okay, so you have foster homes for some of the pets. Mm -hmm. Is that the same 60-day window? Yes. And how does one become a foster? 
they, uh, pet owner. <laughs> they would, <laughs> they would um, sign up to volunteer with us and they can find out more about volunteering by calling us or checking out our website. We do have an online application that they could fill out to be a foster home. So there is an application process and a background check and an additional training. Um, but our foster homes are wonderful, wonderful people that um, just really care about animals and want to help people too who are in a situation where they just need temporary care for their pets. So. And I assume there would be no need for them to interact with the victim at all. Correct. Correct. So everything's confidential. It that is. is fabulous. It is. Now you mentioned before how sometimes the abuser tried to locate the animal. Um, what do you have in the way of security to keep that from happening? All of our partnering agencies, um, veterinary offices or boarding facilities do sign a confidentiality contract and many times we might move an animal several counties away particularly if it's a rural area, um, you could see a foster home walking a dog down the street, you know, so we try to move them from that area so that that's not a concern. And um, sometimes we might paste, place the pets under false names. We've been known to do that and call it like our doggy witness protection program. Um, or we will, the staff know that the, the only people who can call and talk to them about these animals are ourselves, uh, our staff or the client themselves, that they cannot give out any information to anyone else. So is it only the victim that can communicate with you? What yes. about their other family members? Typically, we, we can communicate with family members if we have a signed release, um, and certainly we get many calls from family members as the first point of contact because they're concerned about a family member and looking for resources to help out. So we absolutely encourage friends and family to call us if they know of someone who may need our services and we can kind of help guide them through that. But for the victims, I'm sure it's also tough on the children mm -hmm. because most of them treat them like they're members of the family as well. To be separated Absolutely. from that pet has got to be difficult for the children as well. Absolutely. And, you know, many times pets are the one source of, of comfort for children who are, you know, dealing with being in abusive homes. So that bond can be really strong. Um, and I always say that for me, the moment that I knew that this line of work was for me was when I did my very first reunification transport. So we keep the pets, you know, for 60 days typically, and then we reunite them with their families. And I was able to reunite a dog with her owner and her two-year-old son. And it was the most beautiful experience I have ever had had and that was truly rewarding and I understood the power of the work that we're doing and so for me that was kind of a life-changing moment. Sounds like that you know we talked about how it was founded mm -hmm. and it sounds like a service that is you know so vital to so many people mm -hmm. and I really do encourage uh, other people listening to this program to keep this number handy mm -hmm. so if they f do have friends that find themselves in this situation they'll know who to contact. Absolutely. And you're very very approachable apparently so mm -hmm. it shouldn't be a, a concern where they are in the state. Right. It's 24 hour service. 24 hours they can call anytime and that's what we're what we're there for. There for the people. Yes. That is fabulous and I would imagine that working with the shelters is such a help to them because most, I don't think the shelters allow pets, is that correct? Yes, there are a few in Georgia that do allow pets, um, but then it's typically dogs. Um, and of a certain size. I correct, mean. <laughs> correct. So that is limited um, and we work with the ones who do provide accommodations typically to provide the vet care for those animals. Um, we do basic veterinary care for pets coming in including um, you know vaccines and paying for heartworm medication and things like that but we also treat for injuries so uh, many times the animals are abused as well and so we're, we're treating for injuries sometimes with that. And who's paying for that? We do. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Well that is such a wonderful thing for you to do because again when somebody's in trauma it's very mm -hmm. difficult when you have all these things going on but you're worrying about your pet as well. Mm -hmm. it, it gets it to be is. too much. It is and and we're very fortunate to have some amazing connections with some veterinarians who are willing to provide their services to us like I said some for free and some um, for very very reduced costs so that's how we're able to do this and how we're able to help out so we're very thankful to them. Oh well, good job. Um, I want to thank Myra Rasnick for being here today. I'll be back with some final thoughts about Ahimsa House after this.
most pet owners feel that their pets are a part of the family. Unfortunately, there are some batterers who use the love for the animals to impose fear and hurt animals. We are grateful to have organizations like Ahimsa House to provide shelter for the animals and support the victims of domestic violence. I want to thank Myra Rasnick for joining us today and for providing leadership for such an important mission. Thank you for watching Victims View. We'll see you next time.